start. Good morning. Uh, I, my name is Liliana Picciotto. I am uh, chief of historical researchers at the Milan Center for Contemporary Jewish Documentation, CIDEC, and the uh, co-organizer of this meeting, along with uh, Professor McNagy's from Matre University and uh, Haim Tzadon <coughs> Ben Zvi Institute. Yesterday, uh, Professor Shakrit eh, qua? No, si. uh, referred to persistence uh, in the past of uh, tradition and uh, religiosity of Libyan Jews. And uh, Professor Romani added from the public the notion of the extra extraordinary capacity of them to adapt themselves to whenever situation. Mm. And um, um, that called um, to my mind a story that uh, I want to tell you. A few weeks ago, in uh, exactly uh, in uh, 24, um, I met uh, uh, a man. Herzl Reginiano in Israel, whose family, a British citizen, was arrested in January 1942 um, by Italian authority in Tripoli. And uh, as a Jewish, Jewish enemy of Italy, was transferred to Italy. Uh, family, families Reginiano, Labi, and others were confined in a small village uh, near the city of Bologna. The village was named Bazzano. Um, in that village in the aut autumn of uh, 1943, they were all arrested by the German police and uh, these families, totaling 59 people, were deported to the lager of Reichenau near Innsbruck. When uh, all of them suffered uh, starvation, coal, and uh, so on. Women and men were sl slept, uh, slept uh, separately. And uh, the Nazi obsession for order and uh, cleanliness was enforced in this camp uh, like in other camps. The mother of uh, Herzl Reginiano had taken her uh, husband's talit uh, along from Tripoli. The talit is the prior shawl, the Jewish prior shawl and uh, she was ordered to clean the floor with the, this toilet. She managed secretly to rip the fringes with the tziziot and to have them delivered to the main dormitory. And then, as she had been ordered, she used the talit cloth deprived of the fringes to clean the floor. Mr. Herzl also remembers that his mother perfectly memorized the Jewish calendar of that year. She so knew when it was Passover. At the eve of Passover, she sent out their daughters to collect radishes, and with the green herbs of the radishes, she was able to celebrate at least Maror, one of the point of the Pesach Seder, as a symbol of the old traditional Passover celebration. I think these episodes are the sign of the extraordinary attachment of Libyan Jews to their tradition. Now, let me present uh, Professor Rumeni. Where is it? <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> Professor Roumani is the well-known political scientist uh, and the most uh, leading expert on Libyan Jews and uh, Jewish refugees. His research interests uh, include migrations, minorities, and Jewish-Muslim relations. He teaches political sociology at the Middle East at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, where he introduced uh, the interdisciplinary study of Sephardi and Oriental heritage. Um, his book, uh, his most recent book, is The Jews of Libya, Coexistence, Persecution, Resettlement, which is now in Italian edition. The, his lecture is The Consequences of the Fascist Deportation of Libyan Jews to Tunisia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My paper today is a brief summary of a major study on the deportation of Tunisian French citizens from Libya to Tunisia between 1940 and 1945. I deal mainly with one specific chapter of the war, and that is La Marsa 1943. My talk is divided in three parts, and if time permits, a fourth part. Number one, the situation in Libya and Tunisia between 1940 and 1942. Two, the Tunisian campaign, 1942 and 1943. And third, the bombardment of La Marsa on March 10th, 1943. Reports based on pilots about their mission and testimonies of survivors. The fourth part, if we have time, the repatriation of Libyan Jews between 1944 and 1945. To be honest, my main goal in this paper was to ascertain how La Marsa was bombarded and by whom. As it will become clearer, there is a personal reason for this investigation. I also intend to set the record straight as to the exact figures of the deportees from Libya to Tunisia, both Jews and Muslims. My research, which took years, was based on archival documents, photos, and panoramic air surveys from military establishments in the US and Britain. Books did not help. While they had detailed description of the campaign in North Africa, the date of March 10, 1943, was conspicuously absent. For example, the fourth volume book, the four volume book, The Mediterranean and the Middle East by Major Playfair, dealt exclusively with the destruction of the Axis forces in Africa and says nothing but nothing about La Marsa. Others would discuss February 1943 and then skip to April and June. If a book mentioned March 10, 1943, it may have been only one line or half without any footnote. This increased my curiosity and determination to get to the bottom of that data. And now to the paper, the first part. We know that the racial laws enacted by Italy in 1938 did not find immediate application in Libya, thanks to the politics of the governor, Italo Balbo. However, a change in the Italian policy towards foreigners living in Libya occurred in 1941 with the appointment of, the, of a new governor, General Ettore Bastico, on July 19, 1941, and the unfolding war events. On one hand, it was important for the Ital Italian authorities to implement an anti-Jewish discrimination in the colony, and even a comprehensive anti-Jewish legislation against Jews of Italian Libyan colonial citizenship granted to local Libyans and to impose the restrictions with greater severity, quotes. On the other hand, the Italians sought to remove all foreign citizens, either by sending them to concentration camps or to their home countries, in the case of the French citizens and Tunisian protected, or to Italy for the British subjects. The legislation failed to be effectively implemented because of war events. 
But the removal of foreign Jews and of Italian Libyan Jews to concentration camps in Libya was carried out successfully and had long-term consequences for the community. Harsh anti-Semitism underlies this relatively vast scale operation. The Muslim foreign subjects were showed a greater benevolence, quote, a, a greater benevolence. The Jews were instead considered as subjects of dubious loyalty. They were considered responsible for making light signals to the British enemy during the aerial attacks, spying for them, them cheering for the arrival of the British forces, for speculations, black marketing, smuggling, etc. The list of accusations shows the growing anti-Semitic sentiments of the colonial rules. The plan for the removal of foreign nationals began in September 1941. General Bastico thought it was urgent to remove all foreigners, with no exception, from military areas, and therefore, therefore he began to act immediately, starting from Tripoli. We know that the urgency of the operation was dictated by the war events in Cyrenaica. Indeed, Benghazi changed hands five times, from from five times between February 1941 and November 1942. Since we are dealing here with the Jews of French citizenship and Tunisian protégé français, sent to the French territories of North Africa, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, let me start by presenting the size of the operation for this group and set the numbers straight. Bastico states that Libya had about 7,000 foreigners of various nationalities, Jews included. He numbered for Tripolitania alone 1,600 Jews of Tunisian and French citizenship. As to Cyrenaica, Bastico gave a general figure of 2,000 foreign nationals without giving any detail as to how many were the Jews of French citizenship. The overall number of Jews displayed from Libya to French territories in North Africa was of 1,861 people, out of which the Jews from Cyrenaica were 624 people. Recent research has proven that the number given by the Italian authorities is correct. Apparently, Tunisian authorities identified 1,838 Jews who crossed the Libyan-Tunisian order at Bengardan. The operation should have started immediately according to Bastico, and it was officially approved by Mussolini in a letter of September 20th, 1941. Negotiations with the Vichy authorities in concluded, sorry, conducted by CIAF, Italian Committee for the Armistice with France, started immediately in their headquarters in Turin and Tunis through the Italian Consul General Giacomo Silimbani. However, this turned to be a delicate issue. The Italians needed to justify the operation to the Tunisian and French Vichy authorities. They had to obtain their agreement and cooperation. The operation required also a complex organization. How to arrange transportation, who should be in charge, by Alcor Guegara, and so forth. The negotiations dragged for a long time, at least until mid-March mid 1942, because the French were on the defensive and showed great reluctance to receive the mass of displaced people. They had their citizens' interest at heart, they claim. As a matter of fact, they did not know how to deal with food, supply, housing, and public security. The French were also asking for identification. What kind of identification? Who should prepare the documents? They requested to be actively involved in gathering information. The Italians were initially reluctant to cooperate on this point, but in the end, they provided the necessary lists and documents. The French were adamant about receiving guarantees about the property left behind by the displaced people. The French wanted to transfer rents of properties to the new destination, and they wanted people to carry enough money for as long time as the war lasted. The Italians refused to transfer rents 
because it was against the war laws, and set the amount of money at 450 lire, 1,000 francs, in addition to jewelry. Needless to say, the amount was insufficient even by the standard of standards of the time. The whole operation took place in two distinct periods, from July 13 to 26, and from August 6 to 23, 1942. 2,542 French subjects and protected people, included, including 681 Muslims and 1,861 Jews. This is a quote. Were sent to the border with Tunisia, with Tunisia. Their arrival in Tunisia of the Jews of Libya continued throughout August 1942 and until the middle of September 1942. The Tunisian police declared that the Jews were of very modest economic conditions, being mostly elderly, children, and sick with trachoma, invalids of different nature, and few healthy adult males. The Libyans headed to Tunisia or Lamarsa were 656 in number. A group of 131 Jews of Benghazi was sent to camp five kilometers away from the city of Sfax along the road of Agareb. A second group brought the total of Jews located in Sfax to 573, in Suz to 35, and in Gabes to 29. The second part, what's the situation in Tunisia between 1940 and 42? In Tunisia, the anti-Jewish legislation decided by the Vichy government in France found application in the protectorate slowly but steadily. In 1939, there were at least 60,000 Jews in Tunisia, including the group holding Italian citizenship. The arrival of Libyan Jews to Tunisia caused concern and apprehension among locals. The Italian authorities neglected them while they showed great concern with protecting the interest of the Italian group, group Jews included. On the other hand, the Jewish community in Tunisia provided some help but they were indifferent in their attitude, first because they were unable, and secondly because of German extortions. Can I have a glass, please? The Jews of Libya in Tunis found place in the Hara, the Jewish quarter. The group in La Marsa rented various private accommodations the main group being housed in a single story building with many rooms set around a central courtyard called Lukala in the local language, opened directly on the beach at La Marsa Plage. Each family occupied one room living out of their meager resources, occasional works, and from little aid from the local Jewish community whenever possible. However, the food was inadequate, the place overcrowded, and sanitary conditions intolerable. The teachers, teachers among Libyan Jews cared for the young and the children, providing lessons at the local synagogue and thus keeping the community together. Libyan Jews remained relatively sheltered from the war until no November 1942 when both the Allied forces landing in Morocco and Algeria, Operation Torch, and the Axis forces arrived, took place starting from November 9, 1942. When General Romer, Romer reached Tunisia by land only on January 25, 1943, the SS Eisenstadt Commando Tunis, led by the commander Walter Rauf, who arrived in Tunis on November 24, 1942 by orders of Himmler, was already active shortly after the occupation of the country to carry out the plan against the Jews. From December 6, 1942, General Nehring, who had assumed command of the German troops shortly before, took measures against the Jews such as 
dissolving the community council, ordered the immediate recruitment of 2,000 Jews for forced labor to be shipped to the front lines. Rauf later increased considerably the number of Jewish recruits and forced them to wear the yellow star. Thus, Tunisian Jews were systematically terrorized, arbitrarily arrested on the street in the synagogues, robbed and recruited to forced labor in many camps divided into two zones, one under Italian and the other under German control. Libyan Jews, both in Sfax and in La Marsa, were also recruited for forced labor. All men over 18 years old were taken to work for the Germans, who often came to look for them in the middle of the night. Libyan Jews from La Marsa were driven up to the camp of Bizert and could not come back for long periods of time. They were used to repair damages in ports and airports after the bombardments. And now to the main thesis of my paper, the bombardment of La Marsa, March 10, 1943. With regard to war developments, the bombing of airports and ports of Tunisia were intended to open the route for the advance of the Allied group troops with Algeria, which occurred with many difficulties due to logistic, logistics mismanagement, the dispersion of ground forces, and not least the winter weather that made it hard on the ground. At the end of the war, it was not clear who bombarded La Marsa on March 10, 1943? The British or the American, or both? We can now confirm that the American Air Force was solely involved in the bombardment. We now have all the de details like the bombardment squadron involved, the names of the pilots, the number of planes, the type of number of bombs, and the damages reported. On that day, the NAS, NASAF, Heavy Bombardment Wing, planned two missions, two missions, one against the landing ground of La Marsa and the other against the main airport of Tunisia, of Tunis, El Awina. I have time, right? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you some details. The bombardment of La Marsa was assigned mission 58 of the 301 bombardment group of Nafsaf, with its squadron 32, 352, 353, and 419. With three airplanes from squadron 513, the group numbered 36 heavy bombers, planes B-17, each one with a load of 144 fragmentation bombs weighing 20 pounds each. The airplanes took off shortly after 1 p.m. from saint Donat and arrived at 1.55 p.m. at Chateau Dun du Rumel, where they met P-38 planes that were supported to be their escort. Only 34 planes reached the target at 3 P317 p.m. They managed to unload 4,392 uh, 4, fragmentation bombs. The bombing of La Marsa remembered as a traumatic event, which caused at least 200 dead and many more injured. It was the first time that the city of the bay was bombed. The bombardment occurred in the afternoon, as I said, at 3.17 p.m., when many people were queuing in front of the few shops, shops to get necessary groceries. Survivors recall that the population was caught off guard and failed to get to safety. The result was a carnage with dead and wounded people scattered along the road to the mosque towards the Safsaf coffee and the Ukala of La Mars, La Marsa Plage. 50 Libyan Jews living in the Ocala were killed, including 13 members, 13 family members of the Romani family, my family. Member, um, the many circulating versions of the episode were contradicted by documents, 
the Ukala was not the target of an aerial skirmish between Allied and German planes. The Ukala had not been bombed because it was mistaken for the German commandatur of La Marsa, which was housed not far away at the Hotel Zephyr. Nor it was bombed by mistake in an attempt to avoid hitting the synagogue nearby. The planes carried fragmentation bombs. As I said, 4,392 of these were dropped in conditions of poor visibility without the crews being previously accurately briefed. Photos taken during the mission, reviewed by intelligence, failed to prove that La Marsa landing ground had been, had been effectively hit, but they could show with certainty that several bombs fell in the sea northeast of town, south and southeast of the landing ground, and quote, several hits on the town of La Marsa. The building was very likely hit by one of the several fragmentation bombs that fell in town. The bombing did not last more than half an hour. And now to the last part, if I have the time. Yeah. The repatriation of the Jews of Libya from Tunisia between 1944 and 1945. Tunisia was liberated in May 1943. The displaced Libyan Jews moved back between the beginning of 1944 and the beginning of 1945. Why did the repatriation of Libyan Jews take such a long time? It was not because of lack of economic or organizational support from the joint. The first relief committee in Tunisia was established by Joseph Schwartz already in June 1943. Starting from July 1943, there are first reports on the situation of French Jews from Libya displaced to Tunisia, and we see a substantial amount of money poured in as first aid. However, the joint <coughs> saw immediately that the repatriation was the main and most urgent issue. It turned immediately to, to the British authorities in Tunisia, Algeria, and Washington to authorize the repatriation. The British answered in a vague, positive way, but they were very concerned with costs, not so much for transportation, which would be organized by the army, but for first aid to persons who had lost all their belongings. The British did not want an immediate return of the Libyan Jews, who were seen as a burden for the British military administration in Libya, even though the joint immediately offered to take care of any economic aid necessary. In September 1943, the joint was still the main source of aid for the various groups of Libyan Jewish refugees in Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, while other relief organizations were lagging well behind. Despite the appeal made in July to the competent authorities, the repatriation issue remained unheeded. On August 25, 1943, the American Jewish Distribution Committee therefore convened a conference between the Americans, the French, the British, and relief organizations to set up the operation. The joint granted economic support during the trip and for the resettlement of the refugees in Libya. Still, at the end of September 1943, Libyan Jews were not yet able to leave because the British administration kept the border between Tunisia and Libya closed, quote, for economic reasons. The joint remained confident that the operation could take place anytime soon. However, in late 1943, none of the French Libyan Jews had returned to Libya. A report on the situation of the community of Tripoli in 1943, possibly drawn within February 1944, finally mentions the recent return to, sh to town of a thousand Jews from Tunis and Sfax. Between Feb February 40, 1944 and April, the Jewish community of Tripoli received from the American Jewish Distribution Committee about 80,600 mal, the equivalent of 168 British pound in 1945, for accommodation and care in the home of the poor. 
However, displaced Libyan Jews in Algeria and Morocco, about 550, and the Jews of Cyrenaica, expelled to Tunisia, about 500, will still, were still out of Libya in June 1944. Transportation was scarce, and very often trips already programmed had to be canceled. On July 20, a joint emissary went to Tunisia to coordinate the operation with the local authorities. Once brought to Tunisia from Algeria and Morocco, the Libyan Jews needed to wait in Tunis for at least a month in order to obtain British transit, uh, transit visas to Libya. While small groups of Jews were able to leave in July 44, there were still 200 Jews in Tunis, 150 in Sfax, 450 in Algeria, and 30 in Morocco. The joint, joint thought that by mid-September 44, all the refugees could return to Libya, while the Algerian emissary of the joint, Elia Gozlan, more cautiously hoped the operation could be completed within four months. Repatriations apparently continued in small groups. However, it's rather difficult to reconstruct transports since also Libyan English subjects back from European camps passed through Tunis starting from August uh, 1944 before returning to Tripoli. To conclude, apart from the bombardment of La Marsa, the study, much longer than this presented now here, has demonstrated how the Italian colonizer and the British military administration treated or mistreated the Jews during the period under consideration. While the, system, the systematic removal of the Jews by the Italians from Libya destroyed the social fabric of the community, the indifference bordering on hostility of the British later did not provide the necessary assistance needed by the community to resettle back in Libya. These factors and the subsequent two pogroms of 1945 and 1945 and 1948 in Libya opened the way to their mass immigration to Israel as soon as it became possible. In the meantime, others like the joint, these Jewish soldiers of the 8th British Army and the Shlichim, emissaries from Israel, embarked on a rehabilitation program of the community which gave them hope for a better future through the only and preferred avenue of Zionism. Thanks. Thank you, Maurice, for having uh, explained the, the inside mechanism of this deportation of French citizens from Libya and Tunisia. Until uh, now, you knew a lot about the 400 Jews uh, of British nationality sent uh, in June 1942 to Italy under the status of internees and later deported by Germans, part to Bergen-Belsen camp and part to Reichenau camp. They were prisoners suffering uh, all the things uh, we know about uh, camps, waiting uh, to be exchanged uh, with the German citizens in the hand, hands of the allied nations. The ex exchange was uh, effectively done some days before the end of the war. And uh, all of them, British citizens, Libyan British citizens, a part of two persons, survived the, sh the Shoah and were able some months later, after a stay in the Vittel camp and Burbul camp, to come back uh, to Libya. Uh, now, if uh, there is uh, some questions, any questions, uh, any comments on the beautiful presentation of Maurice Romanin. Why there were so many uh, Jews with 
French citizenship or French protectorate in Libya? Which were the reasons? Emigration for economical matters or what else? We tried to trace our family history. How did we become uh, Tunisian protégé français? Most of my, my parents were born in Benghazi. My grandfather from the side of my mother apparently was an Algerian Jew. Still, how could it be Tunisian? Well, it seems, it seems, and I bring the example of my family as an example, that there was a uh, connection between Tunisia and Libya. Interestingly enough, Benghazi, I don't know much about Tripoli, but definitely about Benghazi, between Tunis and Tunisia, to the extent that they were like, a, not osmosis, I would say, but a very, very uh, fluid contact between the communities. Uh, I mean, to the extent that uh, their uh, observation of certain uh, Jewish holidays were very similar, very, very similar, unlike uh, the, in the similarities with Algerian or Moroccan Jews, okay? Um, I, we, we tried to find out how uh, they, they received their, their uh, Tunisian citizenship or French Tunis, uh, Tunisian protégé français, okay? It seems that this predates also the consular times, you know, when the consuls from France, Britain, and so on, during the Ottoman Empire, they try to infiltrate these areas for the protection of their minorities. And they granted these citizenship under the allegation that they are uh, defending these minorities uh, after uh, the Hati Himayun and Hati Gulhane of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. So do these predate up to the 19th century? Um, there is some substantial evidence that there is such a thing that the, that the European uh, consuls uh, tried to undermine the Ottoman Empire during the 19th century by granting special uh, status to the Jews and giving them this kind of citizenship. I didn't get the question. So it was under the consular system that they had the French? Yes, there is, as I said, there is substantial evidence that the uh, consuls in these countries have been, and this is part of their uh, plan to uh, dismember the, the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Okay, and just to follow up on that, so were they French speaking or Italian speaking, as in your family, for example? <laughs> Interesting enough, it has nothing to do with the language. My, my parents and my grandparents never spoke French. Okay, so they were Italian <laughs> speaking. So it's really, it's fascinating. I had to learn it for one year at the university <laughs> just to figure out certain documents, yes. <laughs> as, you, as you have understood, this paper um, was based on the research that I undertook in the United States to figure out which planes hit my family that has been weighing on me for last 30, 40 years. How come we lost so many people in one day? And it was by mistake and it was hit by the Americans. Never mind in 1960 that I received a uh, a scholarship from Brandeis for four years to come and study in America. I don't know the irony of this, and I still try to understand it, but this is why I made it a definitely a mission to find out how this had happened. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, 
Now I present you Giselle Levy. She was born in Tripoli in a French-Italian family, half of which originally from Tripoli and the other half from Benghazi. Giselle emigrated definitely to Rome in the late 60s after Gaddafi's Golpe. Her family was the last living Libya for forced reasons. She graduated uh, in uh, La Sapienza University, studied the languages and literature, both